Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity. Darren did make one key statement and when he was talking about who's experts and who are not. I can assure you I am not an expert on biomass. Uh, however, I have two members of my staff here, Angela Farr from the Missoula office, State and Private Forestry, U.S. Forest Service, and Scott Bell from the Ogden office that work with a number of you here on the ground and are the specialists and experts. What I am is someone who recognizes biomass as an opportunity for, uh, for restoration work across the Intermountain West and the issues that we're dealing with in terms of climate change, extended fire seasons, and uh, forest pests um, and the invasive issues that we're all dealing with. It's an opportunity. Along with that opportunity, though, are also a number of issues. And I'll address both of them just to sort of set the context for why we're here, all of us. But in particular, to also give a little bit of the historical background of what got us here. I don't believe anyone sitting in this room is surprised by these three statements. Uh, fire is a key aspect of what we do and the role that it plays in the ecosystems of the Intermountain West. Um, we've known this, it's been a discussion item for years, and because of the fire issue, and in particular, fire season 2000, which occurred in Region 1, Montana in particular, but also here in Region 4 in Idaho, uh, there was a, a plan that was signed called the National Fire Plan. That was in year 2000. Implementation came about in year 2001. With the signing of that pen, we received 1.6 billion in additional funds to the U.S. Forest Service budget. Uh, and that's without counting the amount of dollars that were received by uh, the agencies under the Department of Interior. 1.6 billion with a heavy focus on suppression activities, additional firefighters for uh, on the ground activities, but a very key focus on hazardous fuels. Followed up uh, two years later by the 10 year implementation plan that was put into place by the Western governors. And again, that same focus on cooperation, collaboration among all agencies and a continued focus on hazardous fuels. Most of the hazardous fuels that we deal with are focused on prescribed fire. And yet, all of us know that at this point in time, prescribed fire, any kind of mechanical treatment, is not going to deal with the issue by itself. Along with the natural risks that come along with prescribed fire, you don't have to look any further than the Sierra Grande fire of 2000, or the Cascade II fire that occurred in the Uinta National Forest that, uh, in 2003, here in Utah. Those issues still exist. There's a risk anytime you put fire on the ground. Biomass is an opportunity in terms of how we utilize it that we can get some benefit from those opportunities. But again, we have to keep in mind that hazardous fuels by itself, that's where the emphasis is, but that's not going to be the solution. Let me give a context for the Intermountain region. Uh, region 4, or the Intermountain Region, consists of all national forests within the state of Nevada, Utah, Western Wyoming, which is primarily the Bridger Teton, and Southern Idaho, all national forests south of the Salmon River. Uh, here's the stage that we've been looking at in terms of the 80s, the 90s, and you notice the trend. 120,000 acres, 90s, 140,000 acres. In the year 2000, we were averaging 350,000 acres. 2007, we broke 1 million acres of lands burned just on U.S. Forest Service lands across the Intermountain region. That doesn't count the number of rangelands burnt across the uh, BLM in Nevada, Idaho. Doesn't count the acres that were burned in the in Region One, states of Montana, Northern Idaho, or Region Six, Oregon, Washington. But the trend is definitely a factor there. Here's a little history from one of our national forests, Salmon Chalice, uh, which sits in central Idaho and forms the boundary between Idaho and Montana. From 1931 to 1980, we burned a total of just over 200,000 acres. And most of those acres were burnt on the west side of the forest, which is essentially the wilderness area of the Frank Church wilderness area. From 1980 to 
From 1981 to 2007, we burnt over 1.2 million acres, and no longer just within the wilderness areas of the Frank Church, but now we're in the uh, east side, more of the urbanized areas of the uh, Salmon Chalice. And this is just part of the story for one national forest, which can be repeated across multiple national forests, not just within the Intermountain region, but also as you get into the other uh, lands of the Forest Service. This is probably, for me, the most telling historical record that we have here. And if you take a look at the early period from 1930 into about the late 70s, we operated under a very simple fire policy called the 10 a.m. policy. It was put into place by the third chief of the U.S. Forest Service. And it was the result of the 1910 wildfires. And the angst left over from those wildfires stated that fire was a complete enemy of uh, the forest and that the highest responsibility of the U.S. Forest Service was to extinguish all fires. And as a result of the 10 a.m. policy, again, very simplistic. Each forester on the ground was directed that at the start of any wildfire on the ground, they were to bring all resources to bear to put out any fire by 10 a.m. of the next day. If they did not succeed, they would then double their efforts to, again, focus on control by 10 a.m. the next day. That policy existed for almost 50 years of operations and was highly successful, as you can see by the graph. But as you take a look, starting in the 80s, suddenly we started getting some blips. Now, again, I'm only talking the Intermountain region. You can take this graph and put it across BLM lands, you can put it across all U.S. Forest Service lands, and you'll see the same trend. Remember this angst? That's uh, right here, Yellowstone, 1988, or the destruction of Yellowstone as it was highlighted in the press. And yet, we didn't think it would get any worse. 1994, all the wildfires along the, uh, in Idaho, in particular on the Payette and uh, Boise National Forest. And then finally, the signing of the National Fire Plan was the result of the fires of 2000, where we hit just over 900,000 acres, without knowing that by 2007, we'd be pushing a total of over 1 million acres. So, from one of our studies, fire season has averaged over two, over uh, 70 acres have, excuse me, fire season by itself has expanded by over 70 days in most regions of the Forest Service and all federal, land, federal and state lands. If it's expanded for fire, it's also expanded for issues of forest pests. And in particular, mountain pine beetle activity, again, the trend from the 30s through the 60s, some activity, but never over documented one million trees affected. And then suddenly, in the 70s, it starts building. This is all bark beetles, but really mountain pine beetle is the focus here. And then in the 2000s, it just really jumps. And those trends will continue, and part of the challenges that we have in front of us. So we have a discussion of, uh, from the national aspect. We have a secretary uh, of USDA, Tom Bissack, and his focus on where we are and the attention on biomass. And along with that statement, I'd just like to read a continuing of that speech is, markets for woody biomass will provide further incentives for landowners to maintain forests. These markets can provide value for small diameter timber and bolster forest restoration efforts. Expanding markets for thinning and slash could also help address hazardous fire conditions along the wildland urban interface. We also know woody biomass can provide significant greenhouse gas benefits. We have a national support, and yet it would seem like the solution's fairly easy. And yet we know we have a number of factors that are working against us, just the economic conditions that we have facing us right now. The value of the material that we're trying to move really has no value on the ground uh, other than to us for what it can be utilized as such. Transportation costs are always an issue, and I would argue that probably the biggest factor working against us from federal lands is the ability to guarantee any secure amount of material per year over an extended period of time. 
So at the local level, within state and private forestry for Region 4, we're working on two strategies. One is through state and private forestry is to work with business uh, and build business capacity. Woody Biomass Grants, the focus that Angela and Scott work on, is over the, since 2005, we've issued a number of grants when we, you put in matching funds have exceeded $19 million in biomass funds. Working with partners, the key one being USDA Rural Development, again, working and focused on local opportunities to, prov to provide uh, business opportunities and to develop a business source. Working on research, and one of those opportunities was just highlighted in the Salt Lake Tribune, um, this article, Burning Wood to Save West Trees. This is a Forest Service research project on BLM land working with Idaho National Laboratory just outside of Beaver, Utah, a demonstration unit of making the best of what we have on the ground and providing some ability to um, generate interest. The problem that we have, along with the focus here, there's also a skepticism by some members of the public as to what the true intent is of biomass utilization. And that was highlighted by a recent article in the Missoulian concerning the University of Montana's focus on looking at a feasibility study to bring in a biomass a facility for campus. And there's some concern from the public that we're looking at green trees as an opportunity to provide biomass. That's an issue that we'll deal with in terms of the misconception. Um, we have the supply side, which is the other part of the strategy, and this is coming off of national forest system lands. In other words, our national forests. One of them is Coordinated Resource Offering Protocol. It's an interactive uh, website that uh, can give a business to come in, take a look at the opportunities and the amount of wood supply that is being offered over a period of time by all land agencies, federal and state. Region 4 has gone ahead and proceeded with a, uh, the crop process for all national forest lands within the region except for the humble Tayabi. On the other hand, it's an opportunity, but there's also an issue there. It has to be utilized. And without utilization of that website by business entities, you have to debate how much more you want to be able to continue to fund. Probably the biggest opportunity we have is stewardship contract. And some national forests within the region, in particular the Dixie National Forest in southern Utah, have looked at stewardship as a key component of restoration on a large scale basis um, because you can offer a contract for up to 10 years. We have a number of partnerships across the region. Uh, the Utah Biomass Resources Group is focused within all activities within the state of Utah. Uh, looking at options, looking at opportunities to develop businesses on the ground and being able to share information back and forth among all partners, not just federal, state, but also um, uh, private and individuals. Two items that stand out, the PJ Initiative in Eastern Nevada, uh, the Director of USDA Rural Development, Sarah Adler, has been a real focal point for making this work, and in particular, looking at a key component in eastern uh, Nevada as a test initiative. And then the Idaho State, uh, Statewide Working Group, a very focused group looking at a number of uh, collaborations from across the state, again, focused on opportunities within the state of uh, Idaho. Both Doug Martin, representing USDA uh, Rural Development, and Bob Swanby from the Idaho Statewide Working Group they will be part of a uh, collaboration panel that will take place on Wednesday and will be interesting to hear their uh, process as they go through. These other two entities are continued um, partnerships that we have in place and again looking for those opportunities to share information and to make in, uh, to help things work together. Here's the other key partnerships for me. State Foresters and the roles that the states play with uh, the state and private forestry of the U.S. Forest Service. The state foresters, for us, the, uh, within our two regions, Region 1 Region 4, states of Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, Wy Western Wyoming, and uh, Utah, Nevada. They play a key role. They just completed forest action plans, which was mandated in the uh, 2008 uh, Farm Bill. And in those... Uh, forest action plans, 
they have priority lands with priority objectives set aside. All five of the states within our two regions that we're responsible for have biomass as an opportunity and as a priority within those priority lands. These other two entities are key. Western Forestry Leadership Coalition is the spokesperson for all the Western State Foresters. And then they report up to the National Association of State Foresters. I say they're key because they provide us something that we as federal agencies cannot do. We cannot lobby, but they can lobby on our behalf. And uh, the passage of the Flame Act, which occurred two years ago, was a direct result of the efforts by the NASF. Why do we need them to lobby? We have some tools out there, but those tools need to be continued. Stewardship contract, well, it's the legislation for stewardship contract will end in 2013. We need to have it expanded. Uh, there is a policy called the Good Neighbor Policy that's been in place in Utah and Colorado. It's an opportunity for us as federal to provide funds to states to do work on the ground for us. Um, that, needs, that has already ended in Utah and will end in Colorado in 2013. We need to have that expanded. The other aspect I have here is right here, this aspect of social license. They can buy us some social license. Simply put, we need to work in areas where we have the support to proceed along. And you've seen over the last 20 years the support for forestry and the need for thinning has changed considerably. Communities like uh, Darby, Montana, Helena, Montana, they understand the issues out there and they're willing to support and they have their collaboration groups in place to support us. I would argue that areas of the Wasatch Front, they're not quite ready there, especially in the more urban areas because they don't see the true impact of what's coming. We need to be careful with the social license. We need to apply it and work in those areas that we have the opportunity. These political side can assist us. If you just took a look at the major article that was in the Salt Lake Tribune uh, two Sundays ago, they did quite the article, six pages uh, supplement, talking about our dying forest, the issues that are out there. And that's what helps us gain that social license as we proceed. So this is our national process that's in front of us. Um, biomass utilization is a tool. We have options, we have opportunities, we have challenges. We all know that. But it's an opportunity that we're all here together over the next two days to try and see what we can do to work together. And I'd like to just read in closing a, cl a statement from, uh, it's a position statement that came from the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition this year. There is an increasing consensus that sustaining and enhancing the health of forests in the Western U.S. requires a collaborative, landscape scale approach. Western forests face an increasing host of threats, threats, including climate change, wildland fire, and insect and disease infestations. The one commonality among these trends is that they cross forest boundaries and ownerships. To sustainably manage Western forested landscapes and maximize the vital services they provide, including clean air and water, recreational opportunities, and forest products and jobs, it is crucial for all stakeholders to work together. Collaboration among those who have a stake in the future of the forest, both at the national and local levels, is a powerful tool to support and guide management needed to accomplish desired outcomes. And that's why we're here together. Thank you.